I'm delighted to be able to co-host uh, this evening's event with the Environment Institute from the University of Adelaide. And in welcoming you here tonight, I also acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and pay our respects to the elders of the Ngunnawal people, both past and present. I thank you all for coming along, uh, especially in such numbers. And my pleasure is to introduce Simon Devicha from the University of Adelaide, who will chair tonight's proceedings. We'll introduce our very welcome guest speaker and panelist. And although you'll be reminded again, I'll finish by reminding you to turn off your mobile phones. Simon. Thank you and welcome. Um, and thank you all for turning out on a reasonably wet night in Canberra. And I believe some people are here from Sydney, Melbourne, and ourselves from Adelaide. Um, just before I introduce Paul Ehrlich, could I give you an outline for the night? Paul will speak first. Um, we're going to follow his um, uh, presentation with a panel of, that will include Paul and three leading Australian ecologists, Professor Corey Bradshaw, Graham Pike, and David Lindemeyer. Um, we also um, uh, just wanted to um, uh, let people know that um, you're more than welcome to tweet or use any social media um, uh, to talk about this event. Um, uh, and if you use that hashtag, um, we'll be able to pick up on um, uh, the information and indeed possibly insert your questions into the flow of the panel discussion um, if it's appropriate and tight. Also, if you tweet um, and you're not present, um, uh, people will see those tweets and understand what's going on. Um, Another reminder, please switch off your mobile phones or turn them to silent. <laughs> and my final um, uh, logistical slide for the night, um, uh, we're recording this. Um, uh, so please be aware that when you ask questions, um, uh, that it's being recorded. Um, I'd encourage you to think about your questions now and as Paul speaks and as the panel speaks so that you can make them concise. Please wait until you get the microphone and speak into the microphone as well so we can um, hear the questions. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Paul Ehrlich. Like many people here, I feel that he needs little introduction, and everyone here, I'm sure, has heard of his book, The Population Bomb. You'll also be aware that there are many hundreds of subsequent articles and books that he's published or co-published that update, validate, and revise the conclusions from The Population Bomb. His output is prolific, and he's the winner of many prizes for it. I'd encourage everybody to look at his Stanford University webpage to see a full list of some of the highlighted prizes there. Um, uh, and they are highly impressive. And uh, I'm not going to read them out now, but I'd simply note that he's also um, uh, won the Crawford Prize of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, which is given in lieu of a Nobel Prize for areas not covered by the Nobel. More formally, Paul is President of the Centre for Conservation Biology and Bing Professor of Population Studies at Stanford University, as well as being Adjunct Professor at the University of Technology, Sydney. Or for another take on Paul, Robin Williams introduced him just 10 days ago at Wome Adelaide. Paul, Robin said, is frankly a stirrer. <laughs> He's clearly one who encourages a deep engagement, not just population ecology and human behavior changes, but also the standout crowd here tonight. I, for one, like this type of stirring poll. Could I welcome you to him? Is, is the sound on? Everything, everybody here to the back? Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm supposed to be a stirrer. That means I'm supposed to come here and say some things that are provocative, and then we'll have a panel discussion about it. I can't think of anything particularly provocative. I'm delighted to be back in Australia because we came, particularly this time, to at least sample the tail end of what I've been calling the Murdoch summer. Uh, because as the IPCC notes and so on, he's probably done more than any other human being to wreck the climate and also to encourage population growth through the false news network, uh, a thing called the Australian, which actually we, we actually read back in 1965 before it went bad, uh, the, the Wall Street Journal, which has the funniest editorial pages in the world. So we all ought to take off our hats uh, to somebody who's managed to destroy as much of the world as Rupert Murdoch. Uh, what else can I say that's actually provocative? Well, 
<laughs> I, I'm greatly pleased to be joined here by three of my most valued colleagues, uh, people I've known and whose work I've admired for a very long time. And uh, I hope they'll have a lot more to say than I have because, or than I do, because I've already talked to people in Canberra uh, enough in the last two days for my voice to disappear. Uh, but what I thought I'd start doing is saying, uh, first of all, one of the things that I hope we'll discuss in the panel discussion uh, is what's happened to science. In other words, we are now clearly in the beginning of the endarkenment. You go to the United States, the United States is turning into a combination of plutocracy and theocracy. Uh, we're no longer in a, uh, uh, we're in a faith-based society. Amazingly enough, uh, some of the people in our Congress are uh, uh, quite willing to have their brains operated on by scientists, but they won't listen to scientists on anything else. They fly in airplanes designed by uh, scientists, to sure that they're not going to crash, uh, and yet, again, uh, they never listen to the scientific community. This is also partly true in Australia where, in my view, you have per capita the best group of environmental scientists in the world, the best group of ecologists in the world. Too many of them work for state governments that censor them. Uh, so the Australians pay a lot of money uh, to get a lot of scientific research done. Uh, and then, of course, they block that information from getting to the public, a disgusting situation. Stanford, and I suspect ANU too, are, uh, raise even more interesting questions. Why is it? when we're facing the, what uh, the science, British science advisor Sir John Beddington said was a perfect storm of environmental problems. Why, if you look at the, oh, the questions are gone. If you look at the question, uh, what are the odds basically of avoiding a collapse? There's a lot of debate about that. Actually, uh, Corey and I and uh, uh, Graham Turner had a debate about that at, in Adelaide 10 days ago. Uh, and that this is serious scientific debate. Uh, I. My own estimate, Anne's estimate, is that we have maybe a 10% chance of avoiding total collapse. Uh, but we're willing to work to make it an 11% chance uh, because we got great grandchildren. Uh, Corey's not as optimistic as that. Uh, Jim Brown, uh, energy expert and, and the world's best biogeographer, who is uh, uh, a member of the National Academy, among other things, says we're crazy. It's a really big debate. He says the chance is only 1%. Uh, but he's willing to work to make it 1.1%. Uh, Graham Turner chimed in and said, well, actually, I think it could be as high as 25%, but don't count on it. I think you ought to live it up right now. That's the only significant debate I know of in the scientific community about what's happening environmentally <clears throat> and what the chances are. In other words, some people think there's a big debate about whether human beings are changing the climate. In the scientific community, there is no debate, not the slightest hint of it. Any, anybody who had even the most elementary science, science knew 60 years ago that if you added crap to the atmosphere, you're going to change the climate. At 60 years ago, there was some question about whether it was going to be towards cooling or warming. But of course, where the most serious effects come, that is the effects on agriculture, doesn't matter much. Change it in any direction from a period of roughly 10,000 years of, of unusual stability in the climate, you're going to screw up agriculture. No, not any rocket science uh, in that. So one of the questions is, uh, why does Stanford University and I suspect ANU graduate many, many people who don't have a clue about agriculture? Why aren't universities at the front lines of telling people about what's happening to the world and actually taking leadership to show what's happened. Universities are disgraceful in this world. What do American universities seek? Money. All they want to do is do whatever give, as Stanford was once described by one of my colleagues as a full service whorehouse. And that was a, a pretty <laughs> accurate description. Uh, but is it that different in Australia? Uh, how many, you know, you, at some places I'm even told that you get sort of paid off for papers and so on. But the basic point is, there is no real leadership coming from the academic community, and that's a major disgrace. Now let me briefly, because I've only got two and a half hours according to our host here, uh, let me just go briefly uh, through some of the things, because this is a, obviously a self-selected and knowledgeable audience. What sorts of things are not being discussed in the press besides almost everything that's significant? I mean, we, we had we had a presidential election in the United States in which not one single important issue was discussed, ever, or debated. What did, they, what did they talk about? Can gays get married? Well, I've told this to many, many audiences. I'm totally in favor of gay marriage. 
Why in hell should us straights be the only ones who suffer? I mean, sorry, <laughs> my, my brain is sitting back there, uh, and I gotta be really careful. Hey, Corey. <laughs> uh, the, uh, uh, they debated all of this financial crap. Uh, the, uh, the terrible debt ceiling, the terrible fiscal cliff, the terrible this or that. When they discussed debt, they never mentioned, for example, that for every nickel of debt, there's somebody who's got a nickel of credit, that in fact, the whole financial mess could easily be solved by human beings negotiating with each other. It would lead to some, uh, from some people's point of view, a pretty nasty situation because some of the absolutely filthy rich people on uh, Wall Street might lose some of the money they've been stealing from us all these years. Uh, but uh, it's easily solvable. You can't negotiate with nature. All the climate scientists I know think there's a very high probability, and I know the best, there's a very high probability we're gonna bust through two degrees Celsius in warming uh, and continue up maybe to five. Even the World Bank's worried about four or five. Uh, and that's no, not necessarily the top. And when you look at what's happening, in other words, you hear all this talk about climate change, uh, you don't hear people pointing out that we're putting more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere every year than before. In other words, if people talk about the effort, well, we're building more windmills and so on. Yeah, what you have to do is figure out what are the results, what's happening. I'm, I'm reminded many years ago when Ann and I were in India discussing uh, family planning programs and an Indian government official said to us, you know, you gotta, you gotta give us credit. Last year, we shipped a million condoms into the field. And I said, well, if they weren't used for flashlight covers, that may have covered the first hour or two of January 1st night. Uh, but <laughs> the answer, you can't judge it by effort, you gotta judge it by results. What's happening to the total fertility rate? Okay, so what sorts of things are not being covered uh, in the media in this, uh, uh, in this situation? The first thing is that they don't cover agriculture. Uh, and the second thing, by the way, is that most universities, certainly Stanford University, don't cover agriculture either. You've gotta really seek out the courses to know anything at all about agriculture. Humanity's single most important activity, our biggest business, and if you stop 100 Stanford professors on campus, professors, not students, and ask them where their food comes from, the best they can do is the supermarket. They don't know that, for example, green, uh, uh, the uh, agricultural system in the United States and in Australia, heavily dependent on fossil fuels. Uh, depending on how you do the numbers, something like 25 to 35 percent of greenhouse gases come from agriculture itself. The biggest and most important impact uh, of climate change, climate disruption, uh, is not going to be sea level rise. We can talk more about that. That's the problem back there, I told you. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, uh, it's going to be its impact on agriculture and particularly changing precipitation patterns. Virtually none of them realize that we're faced, if we're going to eat in the future, we're faced with totally revising the energy mobilizing infrastructure on the planet and simultaneously totally uh, revising the, uh, the water handling infrastructure and building it for, for flexibility because precipitation patterns we now know are going to change for the next thousand years at least. It's not gonna go from A to B so we can plan how we're gonna move from A to B. It's gonna go A to B to C to D, <coughs> F, essentially in perpetuity. And uh, we're in deep trouble in agriculture already for lots and lots of reasons. Uh, if you read the, uh, the idiot literature on how we're gonna solve the agriculture problems, what do you see? Well, we gotta waste less. You can go back and read in 1960s, we gotta waste less. Haven't done anything about it, then we gotta have uh, better storage facilities, ditto. Then we've got to improve our crops and bring the yields, uh, close the so-called yield gap. That's because if you grow corn in Iowa, you can get a certain yield uh, and a very high yield. And if you then grow it in southern Mexico, you, can't get such, you don't get such a high yield. So the idea is to bring the Mexican yield up, at the yields everywhere, up to uh, developed country standards uh, of production. Problem, a couple problems with that. First of all, all of the literature shows that the major grains, and by the way, don't fool around with the stuff at the edges. The human feeding base is three grains. And if those three grains are not kept growing, we're screwed, to put it in technical terms. Well, in fact, the rate of growth is changing in all of them, and it's going down. I mean, the, the, it, was, it was gradually increasing, 
and now the rate of increase is going down, and they fully expect it to peel off and go the other direction. So the yield, the yield gap is going to get smaller, at least in part, because the yields are not going to be, uh, the top yields are not going to be as high as they were before. Second thing is uh, that uh, as you warm the planet, it becomes tougher and tougher to keep the yields up, not just because you're approaching the limits of the grains being able to produce, but also you're wrecking uh, the, the, uh, the natural pest control services <coughs> that normally keep Iowa way down. Because uh, the, one of the main reasons you don't get as good a yields in the tropics is guess what? In the tropics, the pests manage to reproduce all year long. And so you have a constant problem of pest reproduction. You'll warm it up enough uh, in Iowa, and the same thing will happen. Iowa is so great because it has a thing called winter. You get rid of the winter, the pest control problems, which are already extremely serious, get much worse. Furthermore, as some of you may have heard, if you read the literature, we're expected to have two and a half billion more people uh, by 2050. That's a lot more people. When Anne and I were born, there were only two billion people on the entire planet. We're going to add two and a half billion people by 2050 who are going to have to be fed from a staggering agricultural system in which we already fail to feed almost a billion people enough calories, and another roughly two billion people are micronutrient malnourished, so some of them go blind, many of them can't function uh, at a reasonable level, uh, and, but there's going to be no problem at all adding another two and a half billion people despite the gigantic nonlinearities that are involved, the, the disproportionate effects. Why do we have nonlinearities there? Well, a major reason is, of course, people are smart. Guess what? When we developed agriculture, people didn't run around trying to find the most marginal land they could grow crops on, grow crops on the marginal land, and then gradually, as civilization developed, move more and more towards the river bottoms and the rich soils. Now, we settled down on the river bottoms, where we developed, we farmed the very best soils. Uh, we drank the clean water coming down the river. We crapped into the river because there weren't enough of us, so you didn't have a sewage disposal problem. Uh, and guess what? Now, every person, well, first of all, if any of you have been places like New Delhi or Manila, you know that we're building our cities out over our very best soil. Uh, and so the people that we're going to have to feed in the future, each one of them, on average, is going to have to be fed from more marginal land, requiring more inputs, requiring more use of energy. Guess what? That tends to feed back on. Uh, and not only that, they're going to, the water is going to have to be transported further, drilled deeper for, pumped further, more energy. Uh, what are they going to do for things like metals? Well, you know, when we started back with the agricultural revolution, we had copper lying around on the surface at about 100%. Uh, now we're mining ores at half a percent. If any of you are familiar with the literature on collapse, particularly Joe Tainer's book from, uh, what, about 1990, The Collapse of Complex Civilizations, he pointed out even then uh, that the, the biggest sign of approaching collapse is diminishing marginal returns. What does that mean? It's not all that technical. It means when we had our first oil well in Pennsylvania, it started at the surface of the ground and went down 69 feet and struck oil, 69 and a half feet, if I recall correctly. That was about 1858. The one that blew out in the Gulf, uh, the Deepwater Horizon, didn't start at the surface of the ground. It started under a mile of water at the surface of the seafloor and had to go down two more miles before it could hit oil. And in fact, there was a paper in Science last week, I think it was, or the week before, reiterating what a lot of us have been saying for a long time, of course, and that is we are forced to use more scattered, less, uh, less pure, more difficult to acquire, more difficult to refine, more dangerous to get resources. And the paper in Science pointed out that even if we had a sustainable sized population and a constant level of consumption, the system would still be continuously running downhill, just hopefully at a much slower rate. So these things are never considered in the press. They're not considered in most courses. What I'm telling you now uh, would be total news to 95 to 80 to 98 percent of Stanford students when they get their PhD, not when they get their bachelor's degree. Uh, universities are utter failures at trying to prepare people for the real world. Uh, and uh, almost nothing is being done about it. It's very sad. Uh, so, but what the hell? You know, it's partly my failure and the failure of the rest of you who are faculty members to not try and get this changed. Uh, 
but I, I'm sympathetic with those of you who have not tried because I've tried and it hasn't worked, so I've just put a lot of energy uh, into failure. Uh, and I think one of the other problems is <clears throat> that most people don't have any access now to what's going on in the world. In other words, the media are a total disaster. The social media are, uh, can be very helpful. The trouble is that for every decent site there is that you can trust in the social media, uh, there's four or five that are just solid bullshit, maybe 10. Uh, for instance, I once Googled um, uh, missing links. And the first 30 sites that came up were very cleverly, expensively done creationist sites. Uh, I, I, I tweet myself, and some, some of the stuff that goes through the tweets is absolutely amazing. Sometimes it's very uh, interesting information. Uh, it depends on what, who's you're, you're tweeting with. Uh, but they, for instance, stuff that just came over uh, my desk in the last day or so. One was the paper I was talking about in science. Uh, a colleague sent me a preposterous thing by a guy named Hans Ros Rosling. He's a statistician who's totally ignorant of everything but statis statistics and tells us that everything's going to be fine because as soon as we make 10 billion people as rich as we are, they'll have smaller families. Now, mind you, <laughs> if you... If you go to, for instance, the Ecological Footprint site, which is a good one, on, <laughs> you find out that to support permanently, sustainably, today's population with today's level of misery, that is, with half the population virtually living on under two bucks a day, with all those people hungry or starving, with all the other threats we're facing, would require to do it permanently, uh, essentially permanently, would be another half an Earth to bring everybody up to the Australian standard uh, in, the, uh, in the long run uh, would require three, four more Earths. They're hard to find these days. Uh, but again, the flow of crap is denser by, actually one of my colleagues, a sociologist, made an estimate. It's about 30 times denser than the flow of, of real information from the scientific community. Uh, and that's because of the funding. That's because of Mr. Murdoch and his buddies and the rest. By the way, the, the distribution of income in the US, you can be proud in Australia that you still have a semi-reasonable distribution of income. It's not really reasonable, but compared to the US, uh, our distribution of income is like an empire of old. Uh, and it's getting more so all the time. And the, unfortunately, the filthy rich are so stupid that they never even learned the basic lesson from Henry uh, Ford who was not a hero of mine by any means, but Ford priced his cars and paid his workers enough so they could buy the cars. Now, the people who are getting rich is mostly just through financial manipulation. The, uh, uh, my, my idea for Wall Street uh, is very simple, and that is everybody on Wall Street should be fired or imprisoned, many imprisoned. Fired. They are parasites. They create nothing of any use. Most of their main jobs is to find ways to trick people out of their money and make the rich richer. If they did their jobs right, what would happen? They'd allocate capital and so on so that you'd get more economic growth. Economic growth is the disease. It's not the cure. If they did their jobs right, we'd still want to fire them, get them the hell out of the way, because they are incapable of understanding you cannot have continuous exponential growth uh, on a finite planet. As, as Kenneth Boulding, a very distinguished economist, said many years ago, if you think you can have perpetual growth, uh, you're either an imbecile or an economist. And I think that holds <laughs> today very well. All right. I've presented some things uh, uh, that are not entirely cheery. My time is about up. And I'd like to hear from my colleagues, but let me say, what are the paths forward? Path forward is crystal clear to everybody who's looked at the whole situation. We have to, as rapidly as possible, reduce the scale of the human enterprise. Not just, not just uh, try and bring the poor up, which we certainly must do. We'd like to make everybody on the planet have a decent life. But that implies redistribution, and people don't like the idea of redistribution. Uh, and, uh, of course, one of the things about reducing the scale of the human enterprise is to lower the birth rate further, considerably further. How do we do that? We do something that's been done in no nation in the world yet, and that is give women absolutely equal rights and opportunities to men. And at the same time, give everybody who's sexually active access to, to modern contraception and, where necessary, backup abortion. If you do those things, the odds are you would actually get population declining gradually in lots of places. The estimates of what might be sustainable over a medium term, at least, run generally in the vicinity of a billion to two billion people, depending on 
how much risk, how risk averse you are. But of course, we're now at 7.1. We're aiming for uh, 10 or 11. And uh, so the issue of exactly where you stop as you downsize the human enterprise and make it sustainable uh, can be debated for 100 years. It's not going to happen overnight. So with that happy thought, uh, I'm trying to recruit everybody in academia into changing universities, particularly people in the social sciences. We've proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that telling people what the science says does not change their behavior. And so the pathways of the future is getting the academic community, including people in the, uh, uh, in the arts and in uh, humanities who can contribute a lot to beginning to move universities to the front lines rather than being followers. I'm hoping before I die or retire, the Stanford University will be dragged into the 19th century, maybe the 20th. I don't think there's any hope at all for the 21st century because our faculty members are too dull. But nonetheless, <laughs> we got to move in that direction. So one of the things I hope all of you will do that are involved with universities is help us move. If you're not involved with the university anyway, go to mahb.stanford.edu. It's the center of the mob. We're mobsters, and we're trying to change the whole picture of society, incremental change ain't going to do it no more. And on that note, I'll turn it over to my uh, much younger and much more intelligent colleagues. Thank you. Doesn't two and a half hours go extremely quickly when you're enjoying yourself? <laughs> I'd like to um, uh, invite Paul back up to a stool, if you could please, um, as part of the panel, and also introduce our um, distinguished panelists as well. Professor Corey Bradshaw is the co-director of the Environment Institute's Climate and Ecology Center and the University of Adelaide's School of Earth and Environmental Sciences go Global Change go Ecology Group. Corey's research is broad and wide ranging from population dynamics, extinction theory, sustainable harvest, climate change impacts on biodiversity, invasive species, and working from the Antarctic to the tropics. As if that's not enough work for anybody, he's also a farmer in the Adelaide Hills, and now I believe he's an award-winning beer producer as well. Third prize. Yay. Our next um, uh, panelist is Professor Graham Pike, who is a, a distinguished professor in the School of Environment at the University of Technology, Sydney. Sydney. His expertise is across ecology, animal behavior, environmental management, climate change, and sustainability. Like all of us speakers, there's a passion there as well. For Graham, this is particularly around birds, bees, and frogs, and he has done extensive research. Naturally, this includes also iconic species, such as the endangered Australian green and golden bell frog. It's not just research, however. I know that Graham and Paul are keen board watchers along with Anne and have been spending time in the recent 10 days twitching. <laughs> Thank you, Corey. And hunting birds in Australia. Could, if we could welcome Graham as well. Well, concluding this eminent group, I'm also pleased to welcome Professor David Lindenmeyer from the Australian National University's Fenner School of Environment and Society. David's conservation and biodiversity research is renowned for empirical analysis and new ecological theory, and the work to see the results used to significantly enhance the effective management and monitoring of environments and biodiversity. This is both in Australia and worldwide. Like our other speakers, he's won and received numerous awards, including not one, but two Eureka Prizes, and I believe six Whiteley Awards for his books. Um, with a publishing record of articles and books that's well on its way to a 1,000, you'd wonder how David gets time to do anything else. But I believe he's a keen, keen cricketer as well. And that, that's a good thing, as I think, and the, the Australian cricket team is um, are looking for some cricketers. <laughs> And he may have a ticket in his pocket to India at this moment. <laughs> with, with, with that, I'd like to open, I, I guess, the batting armor with a question for the whole panel, um, uh, which is really around how, how do you go about transmitting your message around sustainability? Um, so that it's um, heard or received in the most effective manners possible. Okay, I think there's a couple of ways we have to look at this. The first is the message we're trying to get out, and the second is the venue we use to 
for that message. In terms of the message, I think it's great to have talks like we just heard from Paul, but it's also important, I think, to defend, practically defend science. We need to address the indictment that Paul refers to, combat people silly, saying in silly fashion things like scientific conspiracy, junk science, giving people with dissenting opinions equal time when such is not warranted. We need to address those issues through articles that present things in a simple manner. We also need to address the venue. As Paul said, you're all self-selected, you're all probably highly converted already, and it's great that we're talking with you. Many of you will go away enthralled, inspired, become leaders yourself. But we also need to get the message out to the masses, the people who vote, the people who consume, the people who are stakeholders, stockholders, and shares. We need to get the message out to them so they'll do the right thing too. Corey, you're an avid blogger and Twitterer, getting the message out. Yeah, but I'm, I am talking to the church and hallelujah rings loud. <laughs> but, you know, it was interesting, we were talking about this um, a couple of weeks ago from Adelaide, and uh, Bernie Hobbs from ABC Science said something very profound, I think, and she, she said that, you know, sh we should be able to go to the, get to the church and, and, and uh, get excited about the fact that we can do something. Now, we're depressing bastards most of the time, so that's hard, but one of the... I think you, you get a lot of joy, at least, about talking to the really young people. And, I, I, and I'm not terribly good with kids. In fact, I've got I've got one, and um, <laughs> she um, she wasn't planned. And my wife said, "Well, that's what happens." And <laughs> so we were confirmed non-breeders, and uh, then I met Paul and decided I had to change that. And His daughter is spectacular, by the way. <laughs> but but I, I, I found new hope, I guess. Is you know, I was going through the motions, and when she came along, I said, Jesus, she's not going to have the same life that I did, and I know that she's going to have a lot more challenges than I did, and I think what you have to do is you have to go out there and, and you know, do what the church people do and get them while they're young. I mean, that sounds a little bit uh, jaded, I suppose, but why aren't all the people out here who have uh, various degrees and experiences and insight going out and talking to your local schools? Why aren't you getting out there? I mean, it's hard to do, I agree. And even if every one of us only went to one school once a year and gave a little talk about what we're good at and what the problems are, I think we'd see a, a big shift. Education is certainly the key, and it starts young. Education, David, I know that you, you know, intimately involved with it, but you're also not afraid to pull your punches when um, uh, you know, something needs saying, or um, ring-tailed possums, for example, aren't getting saved. I think that there's a number of things to, involved here. One is that we also need to provide the community with some guidance about what is successful. Because I think there is a constant diet of gloom and doom and there's, there's reason for that. But there also are success stories and I think we have to prosecute the case about how things do succeed and why they succeed and create the recipe for people to, to follow, to be able to, to say to people, this is what works, tell me something that works, this is why it worked and how it worked and th the funding and the resources that are needed to make things work so that people have a sense that, it's, that there is hope and that there's something worth investing in because it's important to do so. And if there's been something that our discipline hasn't done, it hasn't really provided enough of the, the guideposts to show where uh, management and environmental success can lie and, and we do need to provide that. This, this reinforces a point that Paul makes from time to time, and that is we have to invoke, involve the social sciences. We have to get the social sciences to ask and answer questions that David just posed. What is the most effective and efficient way to get the message out? And often that's not something that we scientists are good at, so we need advice and help. Paul. I've had plenty of chance to talk. <laughs> <laughs> but I... Uh, I the. Social scientists actually know a lot that they don't communicate about this. I get, how many of you have heard the, me tell the story of the uh, towels? All right, I'll tell this. Oh, all right, a couple of you have, but there's enough you haven't. 
uh, one of the social scientists that I got to talk to the Ecological Society on this issue of how you get the message out is a guy named Bob Cialdini, who's a sociologist, a very well-known sociologist from uh, University of Arizona. And he did a neat experiment. He got a hotel chain to go along with it, and he went into the uh, every other hotel room and took away the little sign that said, uh, reuse your towels and save the environment. By the way, at the we're staying at the ANU, uh, what's it called, the hotel anyway, whatever. And that sign is painted on the wall there. It's not hung over the towel rack. Uh, and he found out that it, he then checked what the people in the room did. And there was not any difference at all whether the sign was in there or not. So he revised the experiment and he put in a sign saying, reuse your towels, save the environment. Uh, and the other sign said, reuse your towels, save the environment. Most people who stay in this hotel reuse their towels. And then it went up to about, say, 20% reuse. I don't remember the exact numbers. So he continued the experiment. He put it and he said, reuse your towels, save the environment in one room, and reuse your towels, save the environment. Most people who stay in room 322, that's your room, reuse their towels, went up to 80%. <laughs> <laughs> and he, call, he calls this um, localized norms. I can't remember the exact term for it. And it turned out to be the same thing when they tested people uh, with smart meters. That is, if they sent them literature afterwards and said, uh, you, you use 20% more energy than your neighbor, uh, that you use 20% more than the average, uh, and you should save the environment to use less, nothing happened. They sent one back and said, uh, you use 20% more energy uh, than people in your neighborhood, uh, then it went up. And if uh, even, uh, excuse me, if they said it'll save money, it didn't have any effect. But if it said the neighbors, uh, the area used it, it went up some. And if they said the local neighbors, people on your street did it, it went way up, just like with the towel. So that tells you um, something about how when we're trying to get our message across, uh, we want to make it as local as you can and get people uh, to spread the word. It's one of the reasons we're going out and talking to schools and so on. The kids go home and talk to their parents, the parents then talk to other parents and so on. So that, that's a good strategy. There, there is actually a really good example of that in, um, in ecology and conservation. There was a, uh, in the Philippines, some of the uh, remote villages, they harvested uh, seahorses and then dried them and sent them off to a middleman who would then send them off to the usually Chinese markets, uh, the apothecary trade. And uh, from the hard work of one very smart woman, she came out and dis convinced them that they needed a little reserve because the uh, seahorses were being depleted and people couldn't find a wage. So they put up this little reserve, and it wasn't very big. In within about, and seahorses breed rather fast, within about six months, they were starting to see some spillover effects. So they were starting to see higher production of seahorses. And the local fishermen in one village said, oh, this is a bloody good idea. Well, the neighboring village got wind of this. And they saw that they, those fishermen were actually getting more on average than they were. So they said, well, if they're going to have a marine reserve, we are too. But, and so they did one. And then the next village down the coast did the same thing. And pretty soon, in about two years, they had 25 marine reserves covering an entire coastline. And now they, the seahorses are doing really well. The, the, farm, the, um, the harvesters have a decent wage, at least at that relative scale. And so that's just, it's a small example where that kind of you know, jealousy can work to, 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 the, to the advantage <laughs> of the earth. So part of this, though, that you often hear um, is are we preaching to the converted? And that's not an example of preaching to the converted, that's an example of preaching to your neighbor. But how do you address that? Um, or, or is it important to be continuing to reinforce these messages to the converted, as well as trying to get outside of our perhaps siloed fields of communication? Well, I, we can't have dead air. <laughs> Uh, I think you have to continue preaching to the converted for two reasons, actually. Uh, number one, I've, always, I've learned that everybody doesn't respond. But if you talk to an audience this size, 700 people, maybe something like that, if you get three or four to really start doing something, that's a valuable contribution. Because, of course, with exponential growth, if each of them gets three or four and so on. And so the other thing, and I've got to be honest with you, if you... It, I can stand being heckled, I can stand being attacked, I've had so much experience with that and so on, but I've got to talk to friendly audiences every once in a while and get together with my colleagues who care about these things every once in a while. When I spent the, uh, uh, Ann and I spent the Christmas time 
uh, with John Holdren, who's a very close, our closest friend probably, who's also Obama's science advisor. We spent most of our time drinking and complaining about, you know, but it gives you the feel, otherwise you may think you're the only insane person in the world. And so I think talking, preaching to the converted is sort of a two-way process, but I think it's also extremely important to try and find ways to not to preach to other people. And we have good models there too. Uh, have ever, any of you know the telenovela story? There's a, an NGO, Bill Ryerson runs it, uh, that produces telenovelas and, and, and similar things. It's a soap opera uh, for uh, Hispanic countries and also they've done it for, for parts of India. And they, do, uh, they look at attitudes before they show the telenovela uh, and they do, a, they do a survey. Then they show it and the telenovela has all the sex and violence and all the good stuff that we all love uh, on TV. But it in reinforces that you have small families, that women have rights, that everybody should have access, and so on. They run that for 30 weeks or something, and then they do another survey, and it turns out that that really does change attitudes. Uh, just like, for instance, introducing contraceptives in an area has many effects besides simply making it easier for people to control their own reproduction. It, it adds to education, to uh, sort of modern outlook, and so on. So anyway. Come on, Corey. Well, I was going to say, too, I mean, the, the other thing is most people avoid uh, confrontation. And it, that's probably wise because, it, you know, no one likes to go around with a bunch of black eyes every day if they're confronting people on the bus. But what, what really does win in the long run, and you might get a few black eyes in the process, but it's evidence. And, you know, that's where you have to come back to the science. And, and Graham mentioned it before when you talk about these so-called debates on television and on radio, giving two people the equal airtime when one side is so clearly in the evidence, uh, in, 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 in rich with evidence and the other side is rich in opinion and agenda. Use that to your advantage. Now, not everyone can, of course, read all of the literatures out. Christ, we can't even read all the literature. There, I think it's uh, someone from this part of the world too, who said once there's two types of scientists, those who write papers and those who read them. Uh, that's what PhD students are for. <laughs> now that's a bit of an extreme example, but it's, there's an element of truth in that, so you couldn't possibly know everything. But there is, if you're smart about it, you can get snippets, and this is what social media is all about. I know some of you probably abhor things like Twitter and the dumbing down of information, but compared to things like the Murdoch rags out there, really, are you dumbing things down at all? So, you know, choose, choose your weapon, but get, get, if you have a specific argument, and most of these arguments, let's face it, they happen at work, they happen over the dinner table with your colleagues, with your, with your family. How many of you can raise a hand and say, I had, a, I had an argument with my sibling about climate change? Anyone? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, most of you probably can't stand your siblings like me, so you can argue till you're blue in the face, but if you, if you base those arguments on evidence, if you actually read a few things and you say, no, well, I'm, you know, your opinion, I respect it, maybe I don't, but you're wrong for these reasons, X, Y, and Z, and then they'll come up with the counter opinion, and you say, well, that's fine, but you're still wrong for X, Y, Z, and now A, B, and C, and so on and so forth. So use the vast intellect in this room to your advantage. Most, many of you have been trained in the sciences. Who's, who's been trained? Who's done at least an undergrad in, in some science courses? Yeah. I rest my case. <laughs> <laughs> You've been trained in this, so use it to your advantage. Use it at work, use it with your family. Don't shy away from it. Occasionally you will get smacked in the face. That's okay, pick yourself up. That's why I say to the PhD students after the first round of reviews of their first paper, and it comes back, failure, loser, go home, you do another job. Pick yourself off the canvas, revise the paper, and do it again. This is why it's always fascinating when people outside of the sciences say that there's a conspiracy amongst us. <laughs> Most people don't realize what a real pack of bastards we can be to each other. And that's the review process. If there ever was the smallest inkling that we're wrong, someone, one of our colleagues, usually a friend, at least for a while, jumps down our throat, rips us apart, tears us a new one, and then we, that's how science is built. It crumbles a bit, and then it's built some more. It crumbles a bit, it builds some more. So there's no conspiracy. I wish there were sometimes. Just to put some numbers on the literature and indicate, first of all, how hard it is to keep up and also how absolutely impossible it would be to have a conspiracy. If you take the web of knowledge, which is a bibliographic database, 
and I did this only a few weeks ago, you search for articles relating to climate change or global warming, you find, not surprisingly, that the number has been increase, increasing meteorically, presently running at about, get this, 30,000 per year. Staggering. A lot of reading. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the things you can also do as a scientist is try and get pertinent things out there in ways that uh, lay people can easily understand. For as I find that most people I talk to have no idea how we know that uh, human influence uh, is big in changing the climate. And uh, all you have to do is explain to, uh, very briefly, <clears throat> the form of carbon that's used in carbon dating, uh, so that you, carbon dating only goes back a few thousand years. The reason is that the radioactive form of carbon uh, uh, decays, and it's gone. So all they have to do is look at the ratios of carbon isotopes in the atmosphere to see uh, that what's being added hasn't got uh, a significant amount of carbon-14 in it, uh, which means it has to have been gone for a long time. How do you get carbon gone for a long time into the atmosphere? You burn coal, you burn oil, and so on. And once you tell people that, they say, oh, I didn't realize that, and yet the climate community really hasn't communicated that, that well. There are, other, there are other, many other ways we know uh, that there's a human influence, but that's one that tends to impress people because most of them somewhere in their college classes have heard about carbon-14 dating. They need to get it in their anthropology class, the archaeology class, and so on. David, I wanted to hear about your sibling. Um, did you win the um, argument, and did you use evidence and data to do it? <laughs> It's an interesting case because um, I have a, have a brother who's, who's significantly brighter than I am. And the, the discussion turned when the, when the discussion moved from simply talking about climate change to the notion of global change. And, and global change includes the extent of, of land clearing, the, the extent of, of uh, fishing, the, the pressure on fishery stocks, changes in agriculture, those kinds of things. And so then, then the, the whole discussion broadens to a whole range of ecosystems beyond simply the atmosphere and then tackling what are the clear drivers of those kinds of, those kinds of things. And, and some of the numbers are quite staggering in terms of how much uh, net primary production is sequestered by humans in their everyday endeavours. And then you can see it's quite obvious that when 40% or thereabouts is sequestered, of course it's going to have a major impact on the planet, and of course it's going to be the 7 billion humans that are at the basis of that. And so then the discussion broadens simply beyond climate to, to many other aspects of human endeavour and how the system works or doesn't work, and some of the solutions that, that come with that uh, beyond simply just the, the climate debate. So I'd like to introduce something controversial, following on from Paul's lack of controversy in his talk. <laughs> I am personally so scared, scared the proverbial you know what, about the effects of climate change, global warming, that to me, those risks may well be less than the risk of growing nuclear. Now, Corey has actually been doing some research on this. I think he'll have heaps to say. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am a pro-nuclear energy advocate, and for one main reason. Um, the, the reason is that there's no way we're going to be able to get a handle on emissions without. And some people say, well, what about all, and we can, this entire topic, we could go on for hours. I won't bother here. Uh, we can talk to me afterwards, perhaps. What about the safety issues? What about the radiation? What about the waste issues? What about um, the expense? There's all sorts of arguments put up. And when it comes down to it, I don't think we have a choice. And I, I generally say, yes, if you know, the entire world canned every single fossil fuel uh, electricity generation tomorrow and put up nuclear power plants everywhere, it would cost us a bit of a, a, bit of a bomb. Uh, and some people might die. Um, do you know how many people died from the, uh, the meltdown in Fukushima? Anyone? Two drowned, didn't yeah. But how many died from the meltdown? Zero. About what? Zero, but you haven't counted in possible long-term. I, I, I'm on your side on this one, mm. but... Uh, no, 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 yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and some of the research we've done, and I'll go into the details later, but I'll, you know, coming back to my point, is that some people might die. 
orders and orders of magnitude more will die if we don't. And that's just humans. Let's not talk about biodiversity. Let's talk about our food systems that, that are uh, the, the, the dependence, absolute dependence on pollination. Did you know we we're talking about food earlier? At least you were talking about how you know three grains. 95% of all human food comes from 20 species total. 75% of all of our, um, sorry, go back, 80% of our food needs to be pollinated. 75% of that 80% is pollinated by one species, Apis mellifera, the, 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 the noble honeybee. Now what's happening to honeybees around the world? You've heard in the news, I'm sure. Now let's see, population going up. Pollination going down. Why? Because of pesticides, because of habitat loss, habitat fragmentation. <laughs> the point is that if we don't get a handle on climate change, which is another driver across this template of an already very disturbed system, we don't, we're not going to win. So, yes, it's controversial, but the alternative is much, much worse. And that's my perspective as an ecologist. Now, I've done the numbers too, you know, I've done it for South Korea. I've got a student who's amazing, South Korean, and we've done it for Japan. And every way you look at it, both in terms of long-term expense, so the levelized cost of electricity, the total number of fatalities, as well as long-term fatalities from oh, exposure, yeah. um, the, uh, the costs, the land use, uh, all these things, the more nuclear you put, nuclear you put into a system, the, the lower the long-term environmental damage. Yeah, I, I got to add that I have been moving more and more in his direction. John Holdren, who I mentioned, who's si head of the OSTP and Obama's science advisor, is a nuclear uh, scientist. And he knows both fission and fusion uh, very, very well. And he's always said to Ann and me that we have to keep it in the mix and see what direction things are going. And increasingly, I see the direction things are going uh, is that although some forms of solar and so on are being deployed and doing OK, in some areas, we're not going to get off the fossil fuels fast enough if we don't, uh, I'm afraid, move more towards nuclear. Uh, there are problems with it, but I, I totally agree with Corey. The problems we're going to have if we go through to, say, five degrees Celsius are going to dwarf anything uh, that's likely with nuclear, even though there are many aspects of nuclear that I and a lot of other people don't like and that Corey doesn't like. I mean, it's, it's not, it isn't sort of an ideal thing, but, you know, there's an old expression called tan staffel. There ain't no such thing as a free lunch. When you crowd 7.1 billion people onto a planet that maybe could support a billion in a reasonable or two billion in a reasonable length of time, there just aren't any simple, all free, everybody wins solutions. It's sad but true. So in part, what you're talking about is a dramatic cultural change. It's certainly a dramatic cultural change in Australia to shift to, um, a, you know, actually um, are producing some electricity from nuclear power, but that's not the only dramatic cultural shift or cultural change that we're looking at to address some of these questions tonight, particularly some of these questions around avoiding um, a civilization collapse. What do you think um, might start catalyzing um, some of those changes? How do we best go about catalyzing dramatic cultural shifts? <laughs> What you do is harangue people like you and hope you'll get out there and do it. We, you see, you run into weird, first of all, all of our everyday behavior we're concerned with <clears throat> is a product of cultural evolution. None of it significantly is genetic. Uh, and uh, so we know that cultures can change with extreme rapidity in some circumstances. Sometimes they change as absolutely continuously. A good example is think about popular music or um, uh, styles uh, of, uh, you know, Clothing styles. For instance, I thought I'd gone into a time warp. When I came in here, I didn't realize that there was some weird ACT uh, cultural shift that had people actually have rags around their neck for some reason. There's no <laughs> ecologist with a single exception down there uh, would possibly do such a thing. So we we have trouble. We we have a re. <laughs> uh, but th this, amazingly enough, we know much more about genetic evolution, even though that's gotten much more complex in the last decade. <clears throat> I don't know, no longer know exactly what I thought I knew. But cultural evolution really hasn't, there's no reasonable theory of cultural evolution, and we really need to understand it more. And of course, in a sense, that's what a lot of social scientists do, but they don't know they're doing it, and they don't do it in a sort of uniform, in a unified way. 
But that's what we've got to do. After all, uh, Cialdini, uh, uh, Cialdini's work was essentially a test of cultural evolution. How do you change people's attitudes towards recycling their towels? It's a minor example, but it's the kind of thing we have to understand much better. <clears throat> and I wish I did understand it better. Maybe. I, you know, I'm going to be a bit of a pessimist here, not that I've ever been called that before. But uh, I honestly think that um, we're not going to really have the penny drop in most people's minds until we have some real crises. Now, we're starting to see some elements of that. Uh, we've had you know, drought and flood and fire in more than we've our fair share, I'd have to say, in the last few years. It's starting to twig with a few people, even, even the people uh, who wouldn't normally twig about much. And these sorts of <laughs> events, now if they're big enough and they're nasty enough, things can change. It takes often one person, and one, and, or at least a, a small group of people, to start that change by saying, okay, let's look at the evidence. We've got a lot of people who are primed for some sort of reaction, uh, hopefully a positive one. Let's do something about this. Now, I, one, of my, one of my pets is uh, the uh, pet, I guess, uh, ideas is about the relationship between tree cover in any country in the world, not just Australia, and flooding mitigation. Now, not, one thing I've never, ever, ever seen ever mentioned in Australian flood politics is why we're not planting more trees to reduce the incidence of flood. Now, I've, I've done some studies worldwide showing that when you reduce natural forest cover, your flooding frequency and severity increases. I've got, I've got the data to show it. Yet, we're talking about building 100 dams, and we're talking about pipelines, and we're talking about canals. Why aren't we also talking about planting trees? Queensland was a deforestation hotspot from 1985 to 2005. They were the last state in Australia to have uh, no clearing laws. That's being rolled back now from clever change of government. But why aren't we, why aren't we addressing many of these issues with one major policy push. We can start to get a hand, handle on some of the biodiversity loss. Queensland has some of the highest diversity in the country. Uh, we, can, we, can get, uh, we can start to go back towards the loss uh, or the, the long-term commitment to the extinction that we have already from the loss that's happened over the last 20, 30 years. I know David's gonna have some things to say about this. And we can also reduce the incidence and, free, uh, and severity of extreme flooding. We're not going to stop it, of course. There's many other things we need to do, but it will reduce it a bit. So these are the kind of lateral thinking policies that we need in Australia, and it will take people dying for us to make major shifts forward. I'm sorry to say, uh, but that's the way it's going to be, because, you know, pe people joke, and we talk about homo sapiens, which means knowledgeable human. Wise man. Wise man. Unfortunately, yes. man. We should uh, you girls are fortunately left homo out. Homo <laughs> which means ignorant man because we tend to react only when it hurts. And so <laughs> attributing far too much planning to the vast majority of us on the planet, I think, is a little bit too optimistic. So that's my pessimist take on things. David, recovering ecological systems. <laughs> OK. I, I think there's a few, a few issues there. One is that the, the science of this is really important. And there is good information about the relationships between tree cover and water yields and tree cover and, and floods. And, uh, and fire, and, and unfortunately, scientists haven't communicated those relationships terribly well. So we get things like the Queensland government telling us that uh, climate science is now post-normal science. And we get things like the Victorian government saying that to prevent floods, we have to clear all the trees around rivers. <laughs> and in both cases, uh, I was aware of only a handful of scientists that actually prosecuted the case that this, this was actually deeply incorrect and that there was good scientific information to, to back up what they were saying. I also think, though, that it's very important to recognise that some of the, the most major changes in our society often come from a very small group of people that prosecute the case very strongly and very convincingly. So half of the audience that we have here tonight has a vote because a small group of people prosecuted that case very strongly and change the way we think about equality in society. And, and so I have quite a bit of faith in people that, that are passionate, that are involved, to help change the things in the ways that we do need to make those changes. And that again comes back to this, this idea of cultural change often needs guideposts to be able to tell us where we have to get to. So we do need those success stories about where things have worked 
and why they've worked and, and to be able to, to indicate that as Australians and as global citizens we want more of that rather than less. And we want the science to go with it to tell us how we should do it the right way, the most cost effective way, the most ecologically effective way that, that gives us those outcomes. So we might throw it open, unless Graeme, you were just about to, no. yeah, um, uh, to some questions. There's um, uh, two roving mics and um, people on both sides. Um, uh, just while they're getting to you, could I ask you to please um, make your questions succinct? No long soliloquies, please. Please think about how to package them um, and put them quickly. Thank you. Uh, yes, I'd like to uh, ask the panel, one of the things that wasn't raised, Australia is theoretically a democracy. Um, we see in some countries that we get a lot more environmental impact when we've got a dictator, um, a, a benevolent dictator. How do we engage with the political process when, Paul, you've just been through an election where neither, neither aspirant had any remote interest in the environment, and we live in a country where we have two Prime Minister and an aspirant to be a Prime Minister who couldn't give a tuppenny poop about the environment. It's a scientific term, you understand? Yes. Yeah, Would you comment? Well, uh, you know, politicians have to go the way the people go. I think, I don't know whether Obama cares about the environment uh, or how much, but he certainly is well informed on it. That I know for sure. Uh, but uh, the people who get you elected are ones that uh, give you the 35 year old jerks who say, You'll never, uh, your party will suffer greatly if you mention climate change. For example, that's a literal thing that's said. Now, we're going to have a big test in the U.S. because Obama is fully informed, I know that, uh, and the issue is going to be the XL pipeline, not because it's a critical thing in terms of how much carbon there's going to be in the atmosphere in the near future, but because it's symbolic. In other words, a huge pressure uh, from that segment of murder incorporated known as the fossil fuel industry. And they're pressing on it very hard because they want to make a lot of money on it. You've got to remember, Rupert Murdoch's not crazy. The reason he does the things he does is it makes him personally rich and his buddies rich. So they're not, they're not crazy. They're not, they're not uh, um, any other reason behind it that explains it all. And that's what's happening. If, if, if Obama turns down the XL pipeline, then there's a, at least a chance that he's taking things seriously and that he's not going to listen to the pressure groups. But uh, over on the left. Um, <clears throat> Paul, I, you wanted all graduates to have some knowledge of food, and I'd concur with that. But you blamed M Murdoch for a lot of problems in the media. But it seems to me that the real problem with the media is that journalists can't distinguish between scientific-based evidence and opinion. Um, I remember 25 years ago, the press gallery, the journalists couldn't tell the difference between a hole in the ozone layer and climate change. Um, this was just prior to the Montreal Protocol, and the, and the questions asked of politicians were really ignorant. And the situation hasn't really changed that much. What would you say about making um, journalists have a mandatory year of science, science in, the, in the university? <laughs> well, ac actually, the fair, I, I'm not sure I heard all the question, but there are a lot of journalists who are very much aware of the state of the world, uh, who care deeply about it, who want to write about it. It's the editors and so on that boulderize the stuff that, that, that decide what get, gets shown and so on. And many of the best journalists have been fired. In the US, I think the number is 3,700 in the last decade, uh, and most of the science journalists. I had a, Ann and I had a huge argument uh, with a guy, um, Ann, what's his name? <laughs> the guy from uh, Deep Throat and all. What? You have yeah, all right, anyway. <laughs> he wanted his people, his science reporters, to know no science at all, because then, what? Ben Bradley. Yeah, ben Bradley, you know, of the, the editor of the Washington Post, uh, because then they could report uh, unbiasedly on it. And I said, do you, do, you, do you want your baseball reporters to never have played baseball? You know, I mean, it's, it was absolutely insane. But th there has been so much, I, I think you can just write off the newspapers. They, they don't have the people with the background, uh, and they are controlled from the top. They're all corporate, and they all feel that you have to uh, uh, 
follow the corporate leadership. So, uh, and, and by the way, Rupert is going to buy even more newspapers in the U.S. He's trying to get the L.A. Times. It's one of the few that actually has published some good stuff on the environment in recent years. Who here reads The Conversation? Okay, amazing new model. I'm, I'm, I'm not just because I've written five articles in it, sorry. <laughs> I, I know David has. Um, you haven't yet. You need to keep writing something. Uh, an entire news outlet written by academics in the specific fields. Yeah, it's not perfect, but it's the best model I've seen going, and it's free. Why aren't we spruiking this around the world? And people are starting to wake up. Even 250,000 viewers a month, I think, they're up to now. Uh, it's an amazing revolution in media. It's certainly the best thing that's happened in media in Australia in the last 30 years, if not longer. So uh, let's try to promote this kind of information to the exclusion of the Fairfaxes and the News Limiteds. I, I agree with Question. those comments. So let's add a different slant on it. And I think to a large extent, we get the journalists we deserve. We're all hungry for entertainment, for drama, for soap operas. And so that's why we get what we get. <laughs> we've got a question up the back and then we've got two down the front. Um. I guess, oh, sorry, I guess one up many there people uh, in the public know that the real change drivers comes from the community. And I would like to see um, science working more directly with the communities um, to drive this change, to change the um, politics and uh, change uh, uh, the uh, corporate sector. Because uh, it seems like a um, um, lot of science research, scientific research <coughs> is founded either by um, government, by um, um, corporate, uh, 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 the corporate sector, and, um, and then um, they, as a result, like uh, if good science get, a pub, uh, get a produced, they might be blocked, as Paul said, and if junk, si um, junk science get produced, and uh, they may, may be used as uh, pro propaganda purposes. I just want to, uh, like I hope that, uh, uh, like, uh, to see how you think uh, the uh, scientific community can uh, engage with all the more the general public directly, so um, people get more informed, so that they can influence the vote. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I understood the entire question, but it, it's you think we should have more engagement with the general public. Yes. We agree. We spend a lot of our time trying to find ways to have that engagement. I actually. I was talking with Dick Smith, some of you uh, know him, he's a very famous Australian, uh, who's been on the right track on population for some time. And he has tried desperately to engage with the general public. He produced, for instance, a, uh, an insert for Sunday Things and produced, I think, several million of them. And none of the newspapers would use them. Uh, there, was no, there was no coverage in the Murdoch press or any other press, as a matter of fact, for that. Those of us who are in the game spend, I, I, probably in the last year, I've gotten out six or seven press uh, releases. And I don't think more than one or two have been used anywhere, and usually by newspapers with a circulation of 200 people uh, or 300 people. I've done probably, uh, in the last year, uh, maybe 70 radio shows, uh, all to small audiences and with some results, but not much. In other words, I think lots of scientists would like to be more engaged with the public, but it's really hard to find ways to do the engagement and particularly to talk to the unconverted. Uh, the, it, by the way, it's very different from uh, four, 30 years or so ago. I did The Tonight Show in about 20 times because one very powerful man in Hollywood in, was very much, uh, Johnny Carson was somebody who made and broke careers and he got what he wanted. And against all the people in the network and everything, he had me, he had Steve Schneider, he had um, uh, several other scientists on repeatedly saying these things. Uh, Carl, Sagan. Carl Sagan, another example. Uh, but that was because he had the power to do it. As soon as John disappeared, uh, I haven't seen a scientist on one of the night, you know, the Tonight type shows basically since, a uh, few, few exceptions. So the problem, is, I, I, the problem is more scientists should be trying, no question. But it ain't easy to interact uh, with the public in the numbers that you've got to interact with. Uh, so perhaps I'll have a little go at that, that, that um, question very briefly, and that is that 
in, in some of our large projects, uh, particularly in the heavily cleared agricultural parts of Australia, we have people that live in the community, they're scientists, and they, they take the scientific work that, that uh, we're involved in in our group at the Fenner School and elsewhere at the ANU, and they have paddock credibility. And they speak paddock speak, and they speak to farmers and landowners on a daily and weekly basis, and they convert the science into an understanding of what needs to change on farms, but also to present the scientific evidence that underpins why you might plant an area in a certain way or might, why you might graze it in another way, and provide the scientific evidence to show why there's a need to change and how it needs to be done and speak to them in the right way. They're smart people, they run businesses, they want to get a profit from their land, but they also want to maintain the, the, science, the ecological integrity of that land. And so that's often the level that seems to resonate best in terms of getting out some of those messages. The vast majority of the landowners that we deal with know that, that uh, climate is changing quite rapidly. In some places, they plant completely different grapes now than they planted 10 to 15 years ago because they know that they can't grow Pinot. They've got to grow something else. So they're way ahead of, of Andrew Bolt way ahead of Alan Jones, way ahead of Tony Abbott. They're there, they're at the coalface, and they're looking for scientific information to guide what they need to do next. And so that's often the, the level that needs to work, but it needs all kinds of approaches to do this, be it on the conversation, be it on the radio, the television, more people to be engaged in politics. You know, there are more people involved in Getter than there are in most political parties. So, that, so people here have an enormous influence if they work out the right way to do it. Thank you. Can, Corey, could we just borrow the microphone for the person right down the front? I'm uh, sorry. Thank you. Um, I'm an undergraduate student at ANU and I'm pretty early on in my degree. And I guess at the moment we've kind of been just sort of discovering the world of academia and we've seen kind of a lot of the literature being focused on um, like the sustainable development discourse. And I was just wondering if you thought that there was really a room for economics to work with environmental goals and kind of lead to better ecological outcomes? Well, they have to. I, in other words, they, first of all, don't think all economists are disengaged from this. I've been spent, my closest colleagues now are mostly economists. I've spent the last 22 years with the Bayer Institute of Ecological Economics. <clears throat> and the best economists in the world are really concerned and are looking at these problems and trying even starting to think about how you develop a, a sort of capitalist economy that's basically no growth. And that includes, can, I, I'll tell you one story and then I'll turn it over to my colleagues. A bunch of us wrote, ecologists and economists wrote an article, uh, the title of which was, uh, Are We Consuming Too Much? Which you can imagine from the point of view of the average idiot economist who writes for the Australian is a non sentence. You know, how could we not possibly be consuming? The, the whole solution to every problem, right, is consume more, go out, go out and buy three more refrigerators and a Hummer. <clears throat> and it turned out purely alphabetically that the lead author was Kenneth Arrow, who every economist who has at least an IQ of over 20 uh, understands is the smartest economist and the most famous on the planet, Nobel laureate, and so on. We sent the article to the Journal of Economic Perspectives, which is the top economics journal in the United States, and we got it published. But since we got the word back, Ken was by al alphabetically the first author, we got the word back that one of the editors had said, well, we've got to publish this article by Ken Arrow and his communist friends. <laughs> <laughs> There's hope. Best economist in Europe is Partha Dasgupta, works with us all the time. The top economists are doing the things they ought to be doing. And you, you can't do anything about the others. I also think that part of the problem is that there's, that alternative economists haven't prosecuted the case for alternative models to the, to the one of exponential growth, like steady state economics and other models. And, and so politicians need to have other options other than the ones that they have at present. And they've been slow working on this, I agree, yeah. And, and sorry, just to, uh, very quickly, one of the things, can you move your foot? Uh, no, I, I, <laughs> you, if I move my foot, you can talk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Move your foot. <laughs> there we go. I think I lost the point a while ago. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I diverted him. See, he was going to say something yes, well, deeply the, stupid, and I was trying to save the, him. Yeah, the, uh, the, you'll hear in the news almost nightly, oh, what's the GDP doing, or, or at least quarterly, you'll hear the GDP, uh, or you'll hear the unemployment statistics, or you'll hear things that really are, are a very poor measure of, of a society's wealth. We never talk about natural capital. We never have a running tally of you know, how much timber is on the land. We don't have a tally of how many species we've lost this year or we're likely to lose last year. We never see these apart from buried in very strange and uh, very poorly worded state of the environment reports. So why we need to get a shift towards some of this natural capital monitoring information coming out in the nightly news. Today we have uh, 20,000 species threatened with extinction. Tomorrow should be less. You know, these kind of things. Actually, one economist whose name skips my mind now, but my brains may remember it, actually redid the economics of parts of, I think it was all of Indonesia and so on. And Indonesia was growing at something like 5% a year. But when they took in, when he took into account the depletion of natural capital, particularly the destruction and the, the uh, cutting down, what Australia does all the time, take its natural resources and export them without doing anything with them because Australia desperately wants to be a desperately poor country and it's working towards it. Uh, and he showed that instead of growing at 5% a year, the uh, thing was actually going downhill. So economists have done this, but of course if the economists come up with the wrong answer, guess what? The corporate media doesn't really spread it around. So we've got, I know we've got one question right down the front, but there's somebody very patiently waiting up the back um, on the next question, if we can go I there first. I must say that I, am, I don't agree with you optimism about economists and I'd like I'd like your suggestion your comments about a suggestion I, I'm going to make about the way you've constructed your panel it seems to me that you should have invited the vice chancellor and asked him about where the university's investments are going and you should also have invited the head of the economics department and asked him what is the actual model economic model that your students are going out with um, and does that model actually enable us to live within the boundaries of the earth? And you, on the panel, you should have also had a sociologist, the head of sociology, and um, a psychologist. Um, and, and, and the question should be, is how do we get our, the students from this, this university and the majority of others throughout the world uh, talking about how to get into the public domain, an economic model that enables us not to make the trade-offs between jobs and the environment, but in fact an economic model that enables us to live within, within the boundaries of the world that you're talking about. Well, <laughs> I'm not sure I heard all the question, but basically, of course, we're doing everything we can to be engaged with social scientists. I have written numerous papers with the chairman of our economics department. I've written a whole series of papers with Ken Arrow, Nobel laureate uh, in economics. Partha Dasgupta is coming to Stanford, the best economist in Europe, to work with me for a year. Uh, I, Bob Cialdini I bring to meetings. We had a meeting of, which included, uh, to write, writing a paper, by the way, a workshop, which included one of our best social psychologists, about three uh, sociologists, including uh, Jean Rosa, who unhappily just died, but was a real moving force in the mob and was the social scientist on the, trip on the American Association of Advancement of Science board, uh, people from the humanities and so on. So I don't think the scientists are avoiding engagement. Or as I think I said before here, we insist our graduate students learn the standard economic models. The economists uh, the chairman of the economics department, a close friend of mine, is just desperate. He got so sick he could not get the economics department to hire anybody who was doing anything sensible. In other words, you need is a fancy mathematical model on something that's of no importance. For instance, in the American Journal of Economic Perspectives, when I examined it, one of the lead papers was on the economics of college football. That's how you make your scores. You get a really fancy model on the economics of college football. So I don't think, again, it's the scientists who are trying to avoid engagement. We're working very hard to build the engagement and particularly not to give the social scientists the point of view that we've discovered a problem, now you've got to help us solve it. Uh, and uh, we've, with a, basically a lot of the leadership is coming now from, this, from a small group of social scientists, but that's the same thing in economics, in ecology, and everywhere else. Most people are just sucking their thumbs and doing the same old thing within disciplines that were established by an old friend of mine. Some of you may have known him, a guy named Aristotle. 
Think about the structure of ANU, and I, I, I can only guess at it, but try and find a department at ANU in which you could solve a really major problem without going outside the department. And yet Stanford University is still in those Aristotelian departments, for, formalized by the Royal Society in something like 1692. It's preposterous. At, at UTS, we're trying to build cross-disciplinary programs to address sustainability including the social scientists, the engineers, the business people, the economists, the health people, as well as us environmental scientists. So we're trying to do that. If I don't have a go at this, I'm going to be shot by Stephen Davies. <laughs> <laughs> and probably sacked by the Vice-Chancellor. <laughs> but um, I really appreciate the, the statement that you made about, about economics and environment. And really, they go together, not separately, one at cost of the other. And, and within the Fenner School, we've, we've started to have a bit of a go at this, thinking about what might make a set of national environmental accounts, what would be the monitoring underneath it, what would be needed to understand how the environment's performing in different areas, to get a set of accounts, not unlike the national economic accounts, to try to build, build that up. And that involves people that have expertise in economics, in ecological economics, in monitoring, in biodiversity and other kinds of areas. And it's and a small part of the puzzle, but it also doesn't get at the other issue that you talked about, about alternative economic models. And we do need to find those so that our, our bureaucrats, our biocrats, our politicians have something alternative to the one that uh, is put in front of them by the Murdoch press and others. Thank you. I believe we've got time for just two more questions, um, uh, if we're quick. Um, we've got one on the right-hand side, and then I think I should come down to the man in the front who's been very patiently waiting to. OK, um, um, thanks for the panel. It's, uh, part of the title of, uh, of today was actually the collapse of civilization. Um, and I think most people sitting here are sort of like equally frightened, and we've discussed the, you know, the, the very low probability that we, we're successfully going to be able to avert this of something like 10% and 1%, depending on, um, on your level of optimism. The other thing we've discussed at, at length is, is the difficulty in actually getting this, this actually potential through to, you know, through to the public, the Andrew Bolts and others who are, who are leading. If we were to actually you know, push this, I mean, I'm, I'm sure it's actually happening, but as far as actually getting that message, because we don't seem to hear people think we've, in terms of time frame, you know, it's not going to collapse as a single thing unless the Defence Force get their way. Um, it's probably more like a, a house of cards slowly crumbling and competition resources and going down to a brutish world. But having some concept of time frame, now we know it's the, it's, you know, it's a difficult question, virtually impossible, I guess, but in terms of actually trying to use the fact that it's, it's not a hundred years away. You know, you know, five degrees is clearly not, not habitable for, for a planet. And actually trying to use something is, you know, get really grisly in terms of trying to shift people so we can get some action. I'm just interested in the panel's view as to, you know, if we don't get smart, what, how long have we got? I'll talk about time briefly. I'll let the others come in shortly, but um, two things. One, if you killed everyone on the planet tomorrow, we're looking at 300 to 1,000 years of committed climate disruption from what's already in the atmosphere now. So that's not gonna happen. The other thing I was gonna to say too is that if we go for very smart policies like, for example, reducing fertility, that Paul's been, and Anne have been banging on about since longer than I've been alive, you can come to some... <laughs> you realize what you said? <laughs> it was, it was we do, we do. <laughs> there was a preposition at the end of <laughs> is when you reduce fertility and, and you do it humanely, it takes a very long time to see a result. Now, I've done some modeling with my, my colleague, Professor Barry Brook at University of Adelaide, and we're, we do a lot of population demography. We thought, wow, let's do humans. They're just another sort of animal, complex one, but still. And we reduced, we did a couple of scenarios. We even went to a worldwide one-child policy implemented over a 90-year time frame. So going from what it is now, worldwide about 2.27, I believe. Yeah, something like a little more, 2.3. 2.3, down to one in 90 years, so to 2,100, thereabouts. And in, if you have the same sort of trends in survival rate increase, uh, reduction in juvenile mortality, 
an increasing age at first breeding for women, which has been a general trend worldwide. You keep those and you reduce fertility, however you might do it, policy-wise or what have you, to a one-child policy in e every single country in the world. Of course, this is ridiculous, but th th this is a scenario. You have the same number of people alive at 2100 than you do now. Okay, so it's a very slow process. Yes, it peaks about 2050, about 10 billion thereabouts, and then starts to decline again. If you take the two world's worst mortality events in human history, First World War, add the Spanish flu in, that's another, what, 30 million people, 40 million 40 people? 40 million. Add the Second World War, that's about 100 million all up, and you put that in that trajectory, you can't even see a blip. There is no effect worldwide. That's assuming all the other rates, of course, stay the same. Now let's increase that to say like a two billion people dead in five years from a massive SARS-like or pig swine or swine flu epidemic. You get something like goes like this, and you get slightly fewer people at the end of the century. We're not going to solve these problems in decades through humane means, even through vast, very inhumane means, like the worst mortality event in human history times 20. It's not gonna happen. So we, we, have, we have very little time in which to act. So, you know, pushing your comment through, do we have time? No, we have no time at all. There are going to be problems, but if we don't start doing big things now, we'll never get there. Can we just jump to our last question? Uh, sitting here in the front row with me are uh, six other people doing an undergraduate degree, Bachelor of Interdisciplinary Studies in Sustainability in the Fenner School. It's not just research, it's also teaching. Uh, but my question is, how do you keep talking to people who just don't care about what happens in 50 years' time? I've spoken to a lot of people who say, well, you know, I'll be dead then, or you know, that's my kid's problem or someone else's kid's problem? How do you keep talking to I, I, th I think I'd return to the NRA principle. That is, there are some people who are never going to get it. <clears throat> uh, and there's no point in trying to, you know, the thing to do is to mobilize the people who have the potential of changing their minds. But some of them are ideologically stalled. Uh, and you're never going to convince Rush Limbaugh uh, or somebody like that that things are going in the wrong direction. But I'd like to end my comments on a cheery note, and that is one of the problems we have in the United States is that most of people in our legislature have room temperature IQs. But the big hope is, with global warming, gradually those IQs may go up. So on that cheery note, I might hand back to Stephen Novus to summarize and thank our panel. Thanks, Simon. Uh, I don't think I would attempt to summarise. Uh, one, because I am less intelligent and less amusing than our panellists. Um, and as a social scientist, I think they've uh, set me a task. <laughs> uh, at least I'm not an anti-social scientist. Um, I will just finish by thanking you all for coming along and would ask you to thank me in... Uh, help me to thank Paul and the panellists and Simon for his very able uh, chairing of this evening's proceedings.